Okay, hi everyone. This is Miriam Hinane, investigative journalist, functional medicine consultant, best known for directing the film Vanishing of the Bees. And I am here with Robert. I, I'm not going to pronounce your name. Is it R.C.? Yeah, yeah, for the non-Spanish speakers, they pronounce it as R.C. Uh, I speak Spanish. It's Arce. Arce. Robert Arce. Arce, Arce, yeah. Arce. Yeah, yeah. Arce. A retired Phoenix police detective with extensive experience overall, which we'll get into, including working with, um, has experience with Mexican organized crime. So before we get into the Mexican cartel, just curious, I'm sure you have a, an opinion and information. When you know, the notion of building this wall uh, first came out, uh, I, I personally thought it was a little bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs to go to that extent. Uh, I think it's even more crazy to have built something to whatever extent. And now it's like a scene out of the film Divergent where you have half a wall in a dystopian sci-fi. So what's what's your opinion on the validity of that wall initially and, and where we're at now with like letting whoever come in? Well, the wall was only part of the solution to me. I've worked, I've worked human smuggling. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I think our politicians need to fix our immigration system. Uh, and we have to stop, uh, how can I say this? Uh, well, I'll, I'll go with the wall first. Yeah. With the wall, I think there's areas that are very, it's important to have the wall to protect our, I mean, it's, when I was working, uh, when I was working at the FBI, we were doing wiretaps and we would have surveillance aircraft in the middle of the night, go out to the desert because we're following load vehicles that are going to head down to the desert and pick up drugs and bring them back. So they're, we are have surveillance on them on the ground, but they always re think that they're being followed. So they'll take down the road, make a U-turn, wait and see if they're being followed. So it's very hard to follow them if they think they're looking for a tail. So we would use aircraft that they could not see because it's so far up and it has really sophisticated equipment that we could track them. Well, this aircraft would go out there and on the mountain tops out in the desert, right along the border to the infrared, you could see spotters the cartels have spotters up on the hilltops, and you can see they have rifles. They're sitting out there because they're watching a mm. smuggling route because they have to protect it. Mm. So they know that once the sun goes down, they have spotters looking to see, all right, where's Border Patrol? All right, Border Patrol just did their rounds. They're not, they won't be back for another hour, half hour. Here comes the load. Okay. Here comes drugs. Here comes people. Here comes maybe a high value person that the cartels want to smuggle into the U.S. to run business. They're not going to send him with a regular load. They're going to protect him. So they're going to have armed guards that are on U.S. territory coming through the southern Arizona desert. And it's wide open out there. Mm -hmm. So with the with the with the cameras that we're looking down, the night is alive. There's so much activity out there where they're like. That this group here is not even us. Our group is over here. So started seeing that. And in the late 80s, early 90s, 90s, because of the uncontrolled immigration in Phoenix, the violence has skyrocketed. We went from Phoenix is always, you know, we're a big city, but we're always kind of like a small big city. We didn't have the big city crime that a lot of the other cities had. Our homicide rate was always very low. And suddenly we went from having less than, 70, 80 homicides a year to 220 homicides a year. We went from our, our investigators being able to solve 90% of homicides, where now they're only solving 30% because all our homicides, 60% of our homicides were illegal against illegal. And you don't know their names. You don't know who they are. You don't know who their family is. When, going back to the wall, mm -hmm. I think there's some areas that it's, we need to put a barrier up to discourage Central Americans and Mexicans from coming down because uh, I like to make a humanitarian argument on, on why we need this or why we need to discourage people from coming. Uh, the working human smuggling cases in Phoenix, uh, going into these drop houses, there's 160 people, 180 people in a house. You walk in and you kick that door in and the reason we would get tipped off is we would get a call from some family member 
in, say, North Carolina. Somebody in North Carolina would call and they say, hey, I paid some smugglers to get my brother across the border and get him here to North Carolina. We got a job lined up, and now they're demanding more money. We already oh. paid. So what they're doing is they're beating my brother up over the phone, and I'm hearing it. They're beating him, and they're threatening me that if I don't pay by tomorrow, they're going to kill him. And we don't have any more money. So, or there's a female, they say, if you don't pay, we're going to. And to me, how, how humanitarian is that? You know, if you leave your borders wide open, if you're in Central America or if you're in some part of Mexico, life sucks. I understand life sucks. You know, life's not fair. But if you I'll create a situation where you're encouraging people to make the trip to the border, there's no there's no barriers to to impede them. So you have a stampede of people coming down. And if they think they're not going to get deported, if I was down there, I'd be coming here. Right. right. I, I would be doing the same thing. You know, right. I'd be looking for a better life. But what people don't realize when the when people leave Central America, because a lot the house with 180 people, I think we only had of the 180 people, I think there were less than 30 Mexicans. It was all Salvadorans, Hondureños. Uh, Guatemaltecos, uh, people from all Central American countries. I think we even had a couple of people from Nicaragua. So you leave Central America uh, and as you, you get assigned to a group of, of guides, of smugglers, and you're coming through Central America. It's not overnight. You're coming to the railroad tracks. And at the time, they, were, they would find a place somewhere where, a, where the train would stop and during in, in my interviews with my victims, they would tell me, no, we got on the train. And I thought, wow, I wonder if they fed them on the train. It must have been comfortable. I didn't realize because I was new. I was a narc. I never worked human smuggling. I learned on the fly right. that, that the train they were talking about was a boxcar that when it would stop in some little town, they'd get bolt cutters, open it up, throw 30 people with two or three smugglers, and here they come. So... Some, they were throwing them on top of the train, and sometimes people fall off, and here they come all through Central America, through Mexico, and here they come. And while, th while this is happening, they're getting, they're getting victimized. The women are telling us that when they left Central America, they were told, start taking birth control. Some of the women- Oh my they, goodness. They're taking birth control. They have the, the morning after pill in case they get now, there's a lot of statistics out there. I don't think anybody really knows. I've heard statistics at 70%. I don't think it's that high. But 1% is too much, you know? So And they want to we leave so, sorry, they want to leave so badly that they're signing up for this adventure yes. where, you know, it, it's like, what are, there's chances they don't even make it. Chance they don't make it. And then if they disappear, yeah. you know, it's... It, it, it's it's horrible. It's horrible. Also, under if we can switch gears, I think that under the Rona, I'm curious to see. You know, I had, was reading one report on the surface. It seems like crime has gone down, but other sorts of crime, which are just not being reported because offices were closed and and uh, basically bureaucracy was was shut down, is not keeping tabs but has caused obviously a lot of disruption and I, I think that has pertains to the smuggling of under the crisis when things were were locked down i i personally believe that in minneapolis or with regards to and working at el nuevo that it was like the show the ozarks and if you've seen the Ozarks, it's about money laundering and you need your like clean businesses to launder the money. But under the everything was closed. And so it, when you look at Minneapolis and when you look at Hennepin uh, County specifically, I mean, really quickly, I was like, wow, there's a lot of in Hennepin. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of fake stuff. Um, in Minneapolis, there's a lot of corruption. So I looked at that area, and it is the Sinaloa, Sin say, Sinaloa. Sinaloa, Sinaloa territory. And it seems like I wanted you to maybe give us, like, if you can, a, a little summation of the, the history. Because what I, what I find interesting, 
and correct me if I'm wrong, is and you mentioned it earlier, is that the Mexican cartels are, it's not really a hierarchical system anymore. Sure, there's like leaders maybe supervising, but they're they're utilizing members and they have these kind of semi-autonomous groups. Uh, so it might be harder to track who's in charge. And I also think, and again, correct me, I'm wrong, that, that the police is complacent in a lot of uh, these operations or they're looking the other way. Certainly with El Nuevo, there were there were cameras in the in the club and the police had access to whatever was going on there. But conveniently, the evidence room burned down and El Nuevo burnt down. So what were on those cameras? I found one case that linked El Nuevo with a Mexican Sureño, I think, and uh, and uh, and then when I asked specifically for the incident, under appearance for the boys that were arrested, it's they scrubbed all appearance, which would be where the tattoos would be mentioned, where then it would be evident which uh, these uh, these members are are with. Why did the police? Uh, why did the city scrub? scrub that so i personally believe that's really what the story is that there was a laundering operation or a counterfeit operation no one talks about the counterfeit pills they talk about the counterfeit bills although no one's asked where were these where's the source of this money coming from okay right. so that's a lot May, maybe we can start with just uh, i was looking at the history from kind of 2001 of Sin Sinaloa and uh, Guzman and the different heads. Are, are you, do you know about them where you can give us a little kind of overview? Yeah, the Sinaloa uh, cartel, uh, Cartel del Pacifico, they have various names, uh, go back probably late, late 80s, I'm guessing. Uh, they've been around, it, they were just a the state of Sinaloa is the Wild West with a lot of the major trafficking families, trafficking names come come from Sin the state of Sinaloa is, uh, okay, you go south of Arizona, you go, there's, Son the state of Sonora butts up against Arizona, and then the next state south of it along the Pacific uh, Ocean is Sinaloa. It shares a, a little bit of, a, it shares a coastline. And but they grow the poppy there for and they grow Poppy. marijuana. Those are, it's just, they've been smuggling even before they were doing dope. They're probably involved in, you know, from any type of goods that they can steal and traffic dating way back. But they, they, they made their name doing, during the days. Uh, eventually, uh, the groups just started growing and growing and they got, uh, it, it became, the Sinaloa cartel became, uh, I mean, as bigger as what they would say is what during the Pablo Escobar days of the Columbia uh, at that time, they just became very big. And what they are, they became a federation of numerous yeah. criminal groups. Uh, you know, they a lot of people think there's one guy in some central location calling the shots. You you have some leaders, in, but the guys that are really moving a lot of the stuff are even further away from that food chain where maybe these leaders at this one spot and say Culiacan, which is a capital, are uh, they're the ones that are organizing back into these loads that were coming from, you know, from Col from Colombia to Central America, coming through Mexico, uh, then on to the United States. But what happened was that uh, these uh, groups will, like Sinaloa, will set up a distribution network not only through Mexico along the leading up to the Arizona, Texas, California border but also all through the United States. And, and one of the ways I like to explain this, I think in a, for a, a, a layman to understand, how do they get somebody, how does Sinaloa get operations in Minneapolis? How do they get operations in some place in Iowa? You know, how does that happen? You know, how does some of these areas work? Because Sinaloa is, is obviously very big in, in Minneapolis. So it was a operation where DEA headquarters in Minneapolis, there's a, I've never been there, but I, apparently there's some river, a big river that runs through, 
and on one side of the river was DEA headquarters, and on the other side was uh, some really fancy, expensive towers, and the Sinaloa cartel distribution boss for Minneapolis had an apartment overlooking DEA headquarters, looking across when he got busted. This is probably a year and a half ago, I'm guessing. It was all over the news there in Minneapolis. But let's let's take it. Phoenix is a, a Phoenix is one of the Phoenix and Tucson in Arizona are one of the hubs for the Sinaloa cartel. At one time, it was also a big hub for the Beltran Levas, who split off from Sinaloa in but, 2008. Yeah, around 2008, they split off. We still have Beltran Levas some presence here in Phoenix. It's just a. It's going to be very. It's a traditional uh, presence that they've been here. They're still moving. They're just not. Uh, have the strength that they had in the heyday. So say they're uh, in Phoenix, they'll show up. And, and when I say this, I, I, I can say this from investigations, from working undercover, from doing wiretaps, debriefing and interrogating suspects over years and years and years to this point, still able to have contacts in Mexico who feed me information. So I'll give you an example how it would occur. Uh, you have a Phoenix becomes a hub. And in Phoenix, say the Sinaloa, uh, uh, say a group, a cell of the Sinaloa cartel will set up shop and they're moving movement. Phoenix is so big, they set up what they would refer to as like a plaza boss. So they'll have a boss that's in charge of distributing to sub like little subgroups of this guy. So there's other guys from maybe Sinaloa his buddies, guys that he grew up with, or people he trusts, and where's one guy that's distributing to Glendale, another one to Northeast Phoenix, downtown Phoenix. They have agreements so they don't fight, and they have territories mapped out. And they might have a couple of different, what we would refer to as plaza bosses, which th they control a certain area market. And if there's any disputes, they have to settle it themselves. Sometimes these groups will fight over either dope or women. I mean, guys are still always fighting over women. They're going to fight over women. Uh, you could see these guys at the clubs. There's cl there's Mexican clubs all over Phoenix. You We would do surveillance. You would show up. You They would show up decked out in their high-rise trucks. The You could see the leader with bodyguards, and they're walking around, like, I mean, just openly. Yeah. Openly here. That's just, there's no fear.